There are many ways of telling the story of the importance of theology. In fact, there's a very ancient story about the importance of God and theology that's told involving a piece of fruit. Here I've got Connor Cunningham, and he's going to use an apple to tell the story in a new way. Over to you, Connor. Yes, well, we've all heard the story of the apple in Genesis, which is Tom saying isn't actually an apple, it is a piece of fruit, fruit. in Hebrew. People don't know, know that. But I don't know how to bring a piece of fruit in, so I've just brought an apple in. And I've done so in a hope in, to explain what theology might mean and how we can have a different telling of God and the apple. And what I want to show is within this apple, we can unpack, unfurl every discourse, every discipline near enough that this university teaches and that humankind has for millennia. So how can you do that simply with an apple? How can we have this adventure right going inside the apple? Well, the first discourse, the first, first subject that we can think of is how much does the apple cost? Hmm. Well, that's economics, isn't it? And the second question we could ask is, from where does the apple come? Which country? And of course, a country is a political notion. So we have politics. And also we have trade agreements, imports, exports. Then we can ask, well, is the apple fair trade? So we have ethics. And we also have an apple in literature, mythology. Again, back to Adam and Eve. Or culture. You're the apple of my eye, Tom. Or common vernacular. We can speak of Abbey Road, Apple computers, Apple, uh, uh, Apple la label, sorry, record label, Apple computers. Uh, the apple seems to creep in everywhere. We can have it in medicine. An apple a day. Keeps the, the doctor, doctor away. away. But then, if we approach the apple in its beauty, all its different shades and hues, we can think, wow, it can, it can invoke or encourage art, like Cezanne painting it. So now we've got art. And if we smell it, or indeed eat it, we'll receive nutrition. Why? Because it's organic. And I don't mean a lack of chemicals, I just mean it is actually part of biology. It's a, something which grew. So it's part of nature. So we have biology. And if we feel, just hold it, it has a little weight to it, doesn't it? And the weight is a result of chemicals, hydrogen and oxygen. So we have not only biology, but we have chemistry. But of course, chemistry requires the laws of physics. And physics invokes the laws or the practice of mathematics. So we've got politics, economics, culture, ethics, art. We've got medicine. We've got biology, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. But then you have to ask yourself, from where does an apple come? From where does an apple come, Tom? Where do you find an apple? On a tree. On a tree. There's an apple of a tree. I have one in my front garden. And you see that there it hangs, temptingly. And the leaves above it gather light from the sun and they transfer it, they transform it through photosynthesis into food. Energy, food for the tree. And the leaves gather this light and feed the entire tree to you go underground, subterranean, right down to the roots are fed by the light gathered from the sky. But the roots hidden beneath our attention, our view, are still doing something incredibly important because they are gathering water from underneath the earth and bring it right back up to the leaves in the sky. So it is the roots that gather the water, not the leaves. They gather the light. But the roots which are gathering this water also provide support. They cling to the earth. Why? Because to resist wind, the elements, 
but also to hold the tree there as the earth spins and rotates, going through the seasons. And why do we have seasons? Because the earth goes round the sun. So here we have a notion of a galaxy. The apple invokes the galaxy. And of course, a, a galaxy is part of the universe. From the indefinite article, would you like, to the definite article. So now we're into the universe. But the apple still holds further promise. There are within it still lurking a couple of subjects. And we think, here is the apple. Here it is not. Here is the apple. Here it is not. Why is there an apple rather than there not being an apple? By extension, why is there something rather than nothing? The great phrase of Leibniz. This is the beginning of the subject of metaphysics, of philosophy, where we look at the universe, we look at existence and think, why is there existence rather than nothing? And it fills us, or it generates, it encourages a sense of wonderment. Wonderment. And here, of course, the sciences grew out of. Because, of, wow, we have to investigate this existence even more. And that's why we go back up the way from our chemistry or physics and so forth up. But why is there something rather than nothing? The start of metaphysics, wonderment. And in a way, it's the beginning of a religious sensibility. We might write some poems. We might have certain rituals. And this is sort of like anthropology. Uh, but this God tends to be the deity, the good for Plato, the, un the unmoved mover for Aristotle. This thing to which we give thanks seems somewhat impersonal, anonymous even. The unmoved mover of Aristotle, the good in Plato, doesn't have a name. But then, all of a sudden, and we're shocked, there's a knock on the door. And you shuffle over to the door, you open it up, and someone passes through a note, a little note. And you take it back, and you unfold it, and you read it. And it says the most strange thing. It says, from me to you, and it's signed with dreadful handwriting, God. And this becomes then the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. This God is personal. The apple, existence, is a personal gift. It's called creation. Not to be associated with creationism, but the notion of creation ex nihilo, from nothing. In the act of divine generosity, this is the beginning of God talk, theology. But that is not a triumphant beginning, or genesis, if you like. Because for theology, that's only the start of the quest. We have lots of problems that arise from it other religions. There are three religions in the world that have Abraham as part of them, the Abrahamic faiths, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. But then, if God has given us personally, what about all the problems in the world? We have the problem of evil. Why is there evil if God has given us something so good out of divine generosity? And if it's Christian theology, well, then we have the start of what that entails. We have things like incarnation. We've got things like Trinity. Three persons as one God. We have something called salvation, something called sacraments. So rather than it being a triumphant pinnacle, it becomes, it, became, it, it, it is the recapitulation and the starting all over again of trying to understand the apple. And theology cannot divide itself from all those other disciplines we mentioned, all those other discourse. For without it, it would be bloodless. 
Without it, it would be pure abstraction. So it doesn't leave chemistry behind, it doesn't leave biology behind, but engages with them. And it does so in its endless struggle, its endless effort of desire to comprehend why is there something rather than nothing, which is a personal gift. This is the thrilling adventure of orthodoxy, the thrilling adventure of theology. It is God and an apple. It is God in an apple, or as the Stoics would say, it is an apple in God. There's an old medieval poem which says that in every little creature we see the nature of divine revelation wrapped up as the way an argument is wrapped up in a book. Thanks, Connor, for bringing in just one little creature and using it to spin out the mystery of the universe in the same way that we could see it in a book. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>